Okay, it is 7.05 and I think this means that it's time to get started. So there is still a few people trickling in. Uh, welcome everyone. There's about 700 of you out there currently watching this, so welcome. We're excited to have you. Um, so I'm going to just start by orienting you a little bit on Zoom before I start. So in the bottom bar, you see there's a chat window. We currently have it closed because there are so many people of you. There's also a Q&A button. You can ask any questions there and then we will ask uh, Nina at the end. If you want to see closed captions, there's also a little CC button at the bottom where you can um, get to see the subtitles on the bottom. And a common question for the series is, are these lectures being recorded? And yes, they are. And we are planning to post them to our YouTube channel where we have had a few technical glitches in the last week, but they, I promise they will be up. Um, so if you want to see this recorded, it will be posted. Okay, so any logistics out of the way? Welcome everyone to the Science of Cooking public lecture series. My name is Pia Sorensen and I'm here with Dave Waits. And Hi, behind everybody. the scenes, and behind the scenes is Patricia Gerardo. And the three of us organized this lecture series. Um, we usually um, do this in a lecture hall at Harvard. And the series is, is connected with a class for Harvard undergrads where they uh, learn a lot of the same things we are learning here, but in a lot more depth. And normally we do this in person, but this year we are excited to have so many people from around the world kind of joining our community. So welcome if you haven't been here before and welcome back if you used to see us in Cambridge. Um, so we are uh, grateful for the support of several sponsors. The first of which is the Harvard John A. Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, um, which where we're all based. And we are also grateful to uh, Gastronomy Solutions, 1933 Cocktails, Escada Garum, uh, Mersec, uh, NSF funded, uh, Samik, Shimadzu, and Broad and Taylor. So today we are going to make a trip to New Orleans. So on the next slide, you will see our speaker and I'm going to introduce her in more depth soon. But um, let me just give it away by saying that she has been, Nina has been I've heard sometimes been referred to as the queen of gnocchi. And today we're going to really dig into the science of what goes on when you make gnocchi. And there's gonna be a lot more going on, but that is kind of the theme of this. So to put us in the right mindset, I'm gonna leave over to Dave and you will um, guide us through some of the science and then we'll get back to Nina. Yeah, so uh, today we're starting with uh, texture and mouthfeel. Uh, this uh, has a quantitative way of characterizing it. It's through the elasticity or viscosity. It's one of my great loves as a scientist, uh, so I love teaching this part in class. Uh, this week, we're going to talk about the elasticity. And uh, since uh, gnocchi are uh, made of potatoes, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, different types of uh, properties and mouthfeel of potatoes. And you know, you can make bread from potatoes, you can make potato pancakes, you even can make uh, noodles or, uh, out of potatoes. Uh, all of these are solids, and that's what we'll talk about today, how to understand the solids. And uh, I think with, when we hear about gnocchi, you should think about this as the solids. Later, and I hope you'll join us, we'll talk about the other state, which is a fluid, where things flow, and so you can see uh, soup clearly flows. Uh, mashed potatoes have something in between. They flow pretty easily, but they're still a solid. So they're what we call viscoelastic. They combine elasticity and viscosity. And this is something we'll discuss in class a lot. Uh, now, you know that um, the elastic modulus, how elastic a material is, really affects the way you taste. Think. Uh, here we're, we're, we have as an example of tofu, but we'll talk about other things as well. Think of tofu. Tofu can be very hard, it can be really firm, it can be very soft, it can be uh, much, much weaker. 
And how it feels in your mouth is very dependent on that. And many foods feel differently. How you chew them depends on their elastic modulus, how elastic they are, how tough they are. And if you want to understand that from a microscopic view, this is just a little bit of a schematic where I've showed molecules or atoms, whatever you like, organized in some regular way. And really what the uh, toughness or the elastic modulus is, is if I put a force on it and I deform it, the question is how much force does it take to deform something a certain amount? And you can think of it that between every microscopic unit, it could be an atom, it could be a molecule, there's a bond. And when I stretch it, I stretch the bond. And the elastic modulus depends on the strength of that bond, which is determined by its energy, and how many bonds there are, which are determined by the length between the bonds, so the density of these bonds. Now we can measure this, and we can measure this uh, very quantitatively, and that's something that we'll discuss in class this week, and I wanted to sh just show you, I wanted to challenge you to think about how you might measure it. So here I found a, a picture of potato pancakes. I choose the pancakes because in class we often measure the elastic modulus of normal pancakes, but why not do potato pancakes this week? And it's actually very easy to measure the elastic modulus. The point is, the question about an elastic modulus is, if you put a force on the object, it deforms. And the question is, how much it does it deform for a given force? So you can see what I've done schematically. I've taken these pancakes, I put a glass slide on top of it, and I've measured the height with just with a ruler before I do anything. And then I take a weight can be anything, any kind of weight, as long as you know the mass or the weight of the, uh, of the object, you just have to put it on and watch what happens. And if you put the weight on it, it deforms it. And I just have to measure how much it deforms, what this difference is as a function of the weight. And then I can calculate the elastic modulus. And this is the equation. And those of you, how many of you have been with us before? If you know, if you've been with us before, you know that whenever we have an equation, you have to clap. So I hope everybody's clapping. Pia's clapping, Nina's clapping. Everybody should be clapping, I'm clapping. So let's understand this equation. What you have to do is you have to put a force on the object and the force is just the mass of the object times 10. If you measure the mass in kilograms and 10 just changes the math, mass into a force. It's just the acceleration of gravity. And I want to uh, make it uniform for whatever size. So I divide by the area of the pancake. So you have to measure the contact area, the surface area of the pancake. So I take the force, I divide by the area, and then I take the relative change. So I measure the change, how much it's deformed, that's this distance, divided by the original distance. So that's the relative change. And if I do that, I can calculate the elastic modulus. And that brings up something that Pia will tell you about. Yeah, so this really goes back to when I first reached out to Nina and I asked her, so what, what is something that you're just thinking about and that you're curious about right now? And she was like, well, you know, there is this thing when I make gnocchi. And then on came a lot of the things that you're gonna watch today. And um, we thought that a challenge from us to you will be that you can help us think about what goes on with gnocchi. And you can um, do this by applying the equation of the week, which Dave just showed to you. And to give you a little bit of incentive, um, we have a price for a winner. So what we urge you to do is pay close attention to what Nina is gonna show you, and then go and try it out in your kitchen. Try out the gnocchi making in your kitchen measure the elastic modulus the way Dave just showed, send in to this email address here on the bottom, send in a photo, what you got the elastic modulus to be, and an explanation about what goes on in the gnocchi as, as you cook it. And then you have a chance to win a copy of our book and get it early delivered. It is being published on October 20th. And um, if you win, you will, um, have a early copy sent to your home 
And if you don't win, you can order it. You can pre-order it on this link, which we're also going to post in the chat in the little box on the bottom. Uh, and you'll also get an apron. We have beautiful aprons here. Uh, it looks like this, which you can also win. And I should show you what the book looks like. It looks like this. Um, okay, so that is our challenge. So, so if this is interesting to you, um, on the next slide, I'll just remind you super quick of what you have to do. So this can be very simple. You just make the gnocchi, you put some weight on top. It can be a little spice jar, it can be a little jar with a little water in it, just something um, that weighs down on the gnocchi a little bit, not so much that it squishes it, but just a little bit. And then you figure out what the weight of that is, you multiply it by 10, then you kind of estimate what the area of the contact is between the weight and the gnocchi. It'll, since the gnocchi are small, it'll be very, it'll be tiny. It'll be, um, you know, a few centimeters squared. Um, measure how much it deforms and how, much, how tall it originally was and put, put it into the equation on the next slide, on this slide, and you will get the elastic modulus for gnocchi. So this is, if you're eager to do this, this is a good time to take a screenshot to remind yourself of what, what you were gonna do. And this will also be recorded, but if you wanna get going right away on the gnocchi and you wanna do this, then I recommend you take a screenshot. Are we going to okay. announce it next week, Pia? Well, then, okay, so next week we don't have a lecture officially, um, but the week after we will announce a winner. So you have two weeks to do this, two weeks to make gnocchi. Okay, so with that, it is time for me to introduce our speaker. So Nina Compton is the chef at Compère La Pain and of Biowater American Bistro. She is a, also a James Beard Award winner for the South. Um, and as I mentioned before, she um, is known as the queen of gnocchi. So she is going to tell us about gnocchi today. And her cuisine is an interesting mix of her um, Caribbean heritage. Uh, she's from St. Lucia, mixed with some French, Italian, Southern cooking. So a lot of really interesting um, things going on there. And um, with that, join me in welcoming Chef Nina. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm here in my kitchen at Bywood American Bistro, and I will be doing uh, a lot of variations of gnocchi today. Uh, gnocchi is normally made with potatoes. Here I have Yukon Gold potatoes or russet potatoes. And I'm just going to go back to a little bit of history of gnocchi. Gnocchi mm -hmm. is, as we know, Italian. It means knot or knuckle. Um, it's started off in the 16th century in Rome and was normally made with a semolina porridge and eggs. And that has evolved to different variations. Now we're using a lot of gnocchi with potatoes. People use ricotta as different variations. So there's different variations of gnocchi. And it's normally eaten in Rome on Thursdays and in the South, in uh, Campania and those regions, they normally eat on Saturdays, but now that has changed and everybody eats gnocchi almost every day. It is normally a first course, not an entree. So the dish I'll be making for you will be different variations. So we, you can either boil or you can bake the potatoes. And when I was talking to Pia, I was asking her, you know, when I make gnocchi that's boiled, the texture changes. Um, within the first couple of minutes, the half an hour that I make it. And I don't know if that's just water absorption or the temperature changes. And I was very intrigued by that. Uh, when you bake the potatoes, which I did today as well, the water content is a lot less, but the texture is also different. So I'm really curious to know the different variations of baking and boiling the potatoes and what the result is and why. So if you guys can figure that out, I'm really intrigued to know. So we're gonna start with our boiled Yukon Gold potatoes. And we're just gonna peel them. And it's better when you peel them while they're hot. This allows for evaporation um, 
And that is another thing I was asking Pia, that the texture changes when the potatoes cool down. So normally I, I just boil them and I work very quickly with them. So these are Yukon Gold potatoes I boiled for about an hour in salted water. And it's, you know, gnocchi for me is very therapeutic when I, when I make gnocchi or I make any type of pasta because it's very hands-on. It's very peaceful for me. I get to think about a lot of things. I get to zone out um, while I'm in my kitchen. It can be also very interactive on my days off with cooking with my family or with friends. So I really enjoy making it. So here I have my food mill. But I'm just going to adjust my camera here. And I'm just going to process it. Ideally, when, it, when it's hot, it makes a nice shape. Okay. So now we're going to season with a little bit of salt. And again, working with it while it's still hot. Now I'm gonna add my egg yolks. And sprinkle the flour. And I also find when I'm making the gnocchi, while it's still hot, I find that the texture um, with less flour is actually better while it's still hot. I find when it's when it starts to cool down, it starts to get very gummy. Add a little more flour. And you really don't want to overwork the gnocchi with this. Just forming the shape. Get my gloves on. Just till it comes together, a little more flour. And now that's, that's where I want it. And then we're gonna roll this just into inch logs. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna keep a little bit of, I'm not gonna cut all of this I'm just going to keep a little bit of it separate so I can show you the difference in the texture. Okay, so here's our gnocchi. I'm going to lay that out. I'm going to roll one more. And not overworking the gnocchi is really important here. Making sure that it's nice and soft, but it's not tough. Okay, I'm just gonna place this here. And we're gonna just put this to the side. And then I'm just gonna roll these logs and we're gonna investigate these logs later on to see how soft they get after rolling. Then now we're going to bury. And then now we're gonna clean our Yukon Gold, um, I'm sorry, our russet potatoes. And the same thing applies, less moisture 
um, naturally in these potatoes. So peel these. And then we're gonna do the same process. Then we're going to food mill these, same process, just so we get the nice, fine, smooth mixture of potatoes. A little bit of salt. moving it together again, making that nice little well for the egg yolks. I'm gonna add our egg yolks. Mixing it in. Sprinkling a little bit of flour. And then slowly mixing it together. When I make gnocchi, I like to also, as I form it, I like to freeze it. It allows the shape to stay intact. They don't stick together and they can last about a month in your freezer. So that's just something that most people do in their restaurants when they make gnocchi. They do that. So now we're just gonna Shape it, again, not overworking it. And again, cutting it into the logs. And then Cutting it into those one inch cubes again. And then placing our gnocchi on the cutting board. And we'll do the same application here. We'll put these on the trays. You see how they hold up once they cool. Just gonna place these here. And we can look at them after. And you can already tell, I can already tell actually, that the russet potatoes, the texture feels a lot different. It doesn't feel as gummy, and that's naturally because of the water content in the potato itself. So I'm gonna place this on the side. Just place this over here. And then we're gonna go into our baked, or roasted potatoes. So I baked these potatoes with no salt. So here we have our baked russet potatoes, which we're gonna do again, same thing, very hot when we process them. And then we have our baked Yukon Gold potatoes. And we're gonna do the same process of cleaning them, taking the skins off while they're still hot. 
and that allows for um, evaporation of the water because the less um, water that you have in your gnocchi, the better it is. Peel these. And then same process. In the food mill these. And I can feel already the texture difference as well. It's a lot, it's a lot drier. Let me add a little salt. Egg yolks. And then also the flour, just gonna sprinkle. And then same process, just gonna mix that in. And when you're making yolk, it's really about the touch um, because each potato is different. Some contain more water, some contain less. So it's really about the touch. So when you're making yolk, it shouldn't feel tacky shouldn't feel hard and you know over the years i just learned just by touching it what the right feel for the gnocchi is some more flour this is coming together nicely And you can use any kind of potato for gnocchi. I also make sweet potato gnocchi for the curry goat I have at one of my restaurants. Just rolling it into logs. And then same process, we're just gonna cut those into one inch cubes. This is very exciting for me because I've never done four different scenarios of making yoki. So I can already feel the differences in all the textures, not just with the types of potatoes, but also by baking and also by boiling as well. So same thing, we're just gonna let this one rest and once it cools we'll also look at the texture and see how that feels i'm going to put this over to the side and then we're going to do our rusted potatoes as well Same process, we're just going to peel these. And then we're gonna food mill these as well. We 
cooking the sides nicely, getting all that potato off. Then adding the salt. Egg yolks once again. flour. Yeah, not not overworking it because the more flour that you add the harder the texture is and it also becomes very doughy when you try when you eat it and that's why it's important because when you're adding the flour you're not adding too much everybody wants a nice pillowy yoki And then the same process, we're just going to lay these out into logs. Place them on the sheet tray. So while the potatoes are cooling, I'm gonna go ahead and demonstrate a dish um, that is very simple. It's gonna be peas, English peas, a little bit of bacon, butter, and cheese. And we're gonna demonstrate this dish. And while I'm making this dish, we're gonna come back after and we're gonna look at the different textures of the gnocchi. My husband's gonna hold the computer while we do this. So we're gonna get a nice hot pan. We're gonna add our bacon and let that render. While that's cooking, we're gonna add our gnocchi. And you can, as you're cooking, as you're making your gnocchi, you can cook it straight away. I don't add any oil because the bacon has a lot of fat that it's gonna render out and that's gonna make the part of the sauce. Thank you. 
this. Allowing that bacon to get nice and crispy. Our gnocchi is um, floating. And the trick is you got to make sure that when you touch it, it feels firm. A lot of people think that after it floats about 10 seconds that the gnocchi is ready, it's actually still raw in the middle. And you want to make sure it's cooked. Now we're going to add our gnocchi. I'm going to add a little more pasta water. And I'm adding, I'm adding some pasta water because that adds the natural starches from the pasta and it helps thicken the sauce. A little more pasta water. Add a little bit of cheese just to finish. And that is our dish that we're going to plate. That's our gnocchi dish. So while hopefully you're drinking a glass of wine or figuring it out, let's go back to the gnocchi. So this was the first one that we did that was boiled. Um, the texture is, is it's still fine, it's still firm. It's a little bit gummy. This is the second one that we boiled as well. The same thing, it's, it's cool now. Um, it's extremely gummy, it's, it's very tacky, still very soft. Then these are the baked ones. They're a little bit firmer, not as tacky, not as wet. And then this is the last one that I did, that I think is probably the best one. It's very, very firm, it's not as tacky. And I think that one has probably the best texture out of the four. Um, again, normally when I make the pasta, it's a very fast process because again, you can see the temperature affects the texture of the gnocchi as it starts to cool down. So I'm really interested to know what you guys can find under the microscope. Yeah, I, so I just wanna make sure I understood this. So the best one was the russet that was baked. Yes. Was that right? Okay, okay. And is the russet when it's boiled, is that also better than the Yukon? Yes, because the, the russet potato naturally has less water content. Um, it's less starchy. So, you know, I find when I make potato purees that when you puree, it becomes very, uh, the Yukon gold become a lot more gummy um, than the russet potatoes. So 
out of the two, I think the russet is definitely the best. And it's funny because I normally use the opposite. <laughs> so seeing the four different processes has really like made me rethink <laughs> everything right now. Are you going to change your process? I might. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Um, I have, and so you said that basically less water in gnocchi, the better it is. So what ha is it the gumminess that happens? Is yes, that so what? I think, I think naturally in the potatoes, they naturally have water. I think baking them, it extracts the water through steam. I think also, um, that's why we don't, I don't put egg yolks, I'm sorry, egg whites in my gnocchi, I just use egg yolks because they have less water as well. So I find egg yolks give the best um, results when I'm making gnocchi. I, th I think the less water there is added to it, the better it is, the better result. Okay, we, uh, we did have a question. And sorry, I, I just jumped in. Um, we do have more questions. Did you, did you have more you wanted to tell us about before we go into questions? I'm just intrigued to know what, what's under the microscope. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> Okay, we will, we will, uh, once things open up here, we will look into that. And um, people out there, I encourage you to go and think about this and really experience these textures for yourself. And I love what you just said about the water content because we had several questions in the chat about, there was one about why you added yolks and not whole eggs. And so that seems to have be the water content. Then there was a question about why you don't peel the potatoes before you boil them. Is that also a water content? That is another water content um, because I don't peel my potatoes nor do I cut them because that creates less surface area um, for the water to enter the potatoes. You really don't want them to be overcooked um, or, or soggy. So I think that having them peeled, the entry of water is lessened. Okay, okay. So the water is really the guiding, guiding thing here. I think the water and the temperature is definitely, um, I think that's the variable through this process. Yeah, yeah. And for those of you who didn't see, the recipe is in the chat. So there are uh, exact proportions there for everything that Chef Nina just did. So if you didn't see that already, it's all there. Um, so you can go take a look. Um, I had one, you mentioned sweet potatoes, and there's one question from Anna Neal, which says, um, if you do anything to balance the sweetness in sweet potatoes, and if so, what? I, I don't. Uh, when I make sweet potato gnocchi, I bake them. Um, and this is another water content um, thing that I find also. I find that throughout the the year, because we make them year round, it's on the menu year round. I find that in the fall, the water content is less when I, when I, when I bake them. And sometimes in the summer uh, or the spring, there, there's a lot of water. So I, I don't know if that is just a, a shift in maybe harvest dates or something, but I don't really do anything to balance out the sweetness um, of the sweet potato. That is definitely something I, I don't boil the sweet potatoes. I definitely bake them because they have a lot of, a lot of water in them. Okay, interesting. Okay, so I hope you got an answer there, Anna. One of the questions that people are asking are what flour to use if you want to make gluten-free gnocchi? There is gluten-free um, flour available. I think Whole Foods has it. Um, you can use cassava flour. Does it um, change the texture? It will change the texture. Um, I think you might have to add more because gluten does add that elasticity to the, to the dish. Um, so it, it might be a little bit denser. I mean, the trick with the, with the flour is you definitely want it to, to hold together. And that's with the egg yolks and also the flour. Those are the binding agents once it cooks. So those, those kind of basically set the proteins that hold the gnocchi together. And is there anything you do to prevent the eggs from becoming scrambled when you add the potato? Do you make sure to wait a little bit or? I, you have to mix it very quickly. 
Okay. Okay. It's not if you can, because those potatoes are piping hot. I mean, they, they came right out of the oven. Um, you could see the steam from the potatoes as I was peeling them, but you really have to move quickly to incorporate that um, so they don't scramble. Okay. So Nina, Good. we're big on, uh, in, our, in our class and our lectures, we're big on having everybody do things simply. And they're asking a question, what do you do if you don't have a food mill? How do you process the uh, uh You can get a potato masher. Or you could use a fork, or you could use maybe a cheese grater if you have that. Um, the idea is to have as little lump as possible. Um, you know, a couple of lumps are okay. Nobody's gonna, you know, <laughs> judge. And maybe you mentioned this, but what kind of flour did you use right now? I use double zero flour, which is a finer ground flour, but you can use all purpose flour. Yeah, I, uh, there, okay, that's great. There's a question from Pablo, which I think is, he's wondering, is it more desirable for Naki to be more or less squishy? Because, so I think he's thinking about what he would measure. So how, could you say more about the texture, the ideal texture of a perfect gnocchi? Yeah, the ideal texture of a gnocchi is like a pillow, a light pillow that is not too dense, but not too soft. You know, it's that happy balance of abiding, kind of like a marshmallow, I guess, would be, I, I think the closest comparison when you think about when you bite into something that's not too soft, but it's still, it's still a little bit firm, if that makes sense. Okay, yeah, but we not too- measure the elastic modulus. Yeah, we do. Of, of, of either, we have to find the perfect elastic modulus for, the, for Nina's gnocchi. Yeah. <laughs> Um, there's lots of questions coming in, lots of questions. Um, a lot of questions about how long to bake the potatoes and how to tell whether they're done. Okay, uh, so I, I bake the potatoes for an hour um, at 350 degrees and it's just, just fork tender. And I think the same applies for boiling as well, about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes. Again, fork tender. You really don't want to undercook them because I guess the starch won't be activated if it's not cooked properly um, and you won't get the, the, the desired result. There's another question here about the, this gumminess, um, which I think is fascinating. So a question about if you cook the potatoes starting from cold water to avoid them being gummy, do you have any thoughts about adding them to warm water or starting with cold water? It's, it's um, always the, the rule of thumb when cooking any root vegetable is starting off in cold water. Um, if you're doing it with hot water, the outside cooks much faster than the inside. Um, so when you're cooking in cold water, you're allowing the potato to get completely to full temperature and then it starts cooking. Where if you're doing it in hot water, the outside is cooking before the inside is cooking and that is, that's not desirable. And how important are the uh, type of potatoes? Somebody from a different country is asking, if she doesn't have access to the type of potatoes that you use, is that going to be a problem? I think any, any potato is fine. Uh, purple potatoes are fine. I think you can use sweet potatoes. Um, you could use the small Dutch marble potatoes. I just think that it's the, it's the cooking method, I think, really determines the end result. And is it really important to work with hot potatoes? Or if you didn't want to deal with the heat, could you let them cool and do the mixing later? Yes. So um, a lot of people tend to rice the potatoes and lay them out on the cutting board and cover them with a cloth so they allow the water to evaporate slowly, but they're, they're still a little bit warm. But that, I think that would be the best advice. Uh, I mean, I've been cooking for a while, so I can handle a hot potato, but I think my best advice is to rice the potatoes and then let them cool covered with a... Um, a towel until they're until you're able to handle them. Can you okay. add 
the flower sort of by feel. Can you give some more precise ratio for people who don't have the same experience? <laughs> I know it, it, it's a tough thing um, when you're adding flour. I, I think adding a little bit at a time, slowly mixing it in. I think by touching it and knowing that it's not tacky or sticky when you touch it, um, it should release from your finger, not leaving anything, I think is the best indicator. Um, it's hard to say a ratio because again, the water content affects that, but I think definitely you don't want to have it very tacky. It should be, it should be firm and um, once one uh, complete mass that is uniformly mixed in, um, but not tacky, but also not too dry. Sue is pointing out that the recipe doesn't say how long to bake the potatoes and at what temperature. Oh, I, I apologize, Sue. <laughs> <laughs> I will do it for 350 at what for one hour. Perfect. Thank you. Someone mentioned, um, what if you don't want to use boiled potatoes and you want to work with this potato starch flour instead? Is that even, an, even something you yeah, would consider? Uh, or? The way that you could probably do that would cook it in um, either milk or water, kind of like a slurry or like a roux, um, and then cooling that mixture um, on a sheet tray and then um, adding the egg yolks in the flour. Okay. okay. I haven't done it, but it could be, that could be a good idea. Let me know how that works out. <laughs> okay. The person who asked that should try it out. There's a question here about uh, whether you work with other things than potatoes. You mentioned that there's a uh, more traditional, uh, and this is going back a long way, um, uh, components, the seminola porridge with egg. Have you done anything with that? Do you have any experience with that? Yeah, so, uh, uh, we have currently a semolina gnocchi. Uh, it's cooked semolina and milk cooked polenta style. Um, which is cool, and then egg yolks and flour are added, and then it's cut into the little, the little gnocchi. You can also do ricotta. People do ricotta cheese with egg yolks and flour. Uh, there's also malfati, which is a spinach and ricotta uh, gnocchi as well. Some people use stale bread, um, and they make breadcrumbs with that and cook that in water and make that as their base. Um, I think, you know, the beauty of Italian cooking is that it's it's everything um, you can think of. You know, people use cavatelli, um, using ricotta as well. They use, pe people use butternut squash. So the, it's, it's endless the possibilities. But I think traditionally it's normally potatoes or semolina. Some people use butternut squash or, or even stale bread. So if you use, if you add spinach or carrots or something like that, do you change the proportion of things? Do you add more flour? Do you? So, yeah, I think when if you had to use, let's say, for example, roasted carrots, um, you would roast the carrots, puree them in a food processor, mm -hmm. add the egg yolks and the flour. It would probably call for more flour than a potato gnocchi um, because of the water content of the carrots. What about yams? Um, yams you can definitely use. I've done yams. Um, again, the water content is a little bit higher, um, but those are definitely much easier to use than, say, for example, carrots. There are a lot of questions about um, if there's a reason you're not using the utensil to make the little groups. I have it. I have it right here. <laughs> Yeah, you can, you can use that. Uh, people can use a fork. Uh, the gnocchi board is, you know, just to put the grooves in there. Um, it is a little time consuming, um, but I, I definitely have used it before. Um, it is fun, it is therapeutic again. Um, but you know, when you're making gnocchi, it's kind of time is the essence because again, with the temperature of potatoes. We talk a lot about the Maillard reaction in class. Is there any example? Uh, does the Maillard reaction play a role when you cook the uh, gnocchi, do you know? I wouldn't say it's a Maillard reaction. I would say it's more of coagulation of mm. protein 
and the starches, I think, um, helps set the gnocchi when it's, when it's cooking in the water. Um, you can definitely see a lot of people um, poach the gnocchi and then uh, roast it in the pan, and then you can definitely see the, the caramelization of uh, the gnocchi is, is present. Okay, I think um, I think we can stay here all night, but I'm I'm very convinced that you've shown all of us that you indeed are the queen of gnocchi. Wow. We're just peppering you with questions, and you're just spitting out answers. <laughs> um, because you know, um, when you're cooking, you know, when I'm in my kitchen with my staff, you know, we had a discussion yesterday talking about the why and the hows of cooking. You know, why do you get the pan hot? And there's a reason for that. So it, it, this, this is all very intriguing uh, to me, understanding the depth of, of, you know, making gnocchi. Yeah. Do you have any final parting words about gnocchi before we end? I think when you're, when you're making this in your, in your kitchens, you just have fun with it, you know. Get, get everybody involved, peeling potatoes, separating the eggs, um, and have fun with it. You know, cooking is fun. It's about sharing as well. Nina, I for one would like to know the different elastic moduli for the uh, different <laughs> types of gnocchi. <laughs> I hope we get that information from yes. people who are doing experiments at home. I'm so if you, if you guys do do that, you should tell us what, what you did and what flour you used and any right. kind of variation. And we can just collect all our data and uh, maybe we'll share it somewhere at some point and then we can think about it together. Absolutely. Certainly we'll share it with Nina. Yes. Okay, so I think with that, how about we end? Um, I want to thank you so much, Nina. This was amazing. Thank you so much for inviting us in and um letting us think about this with you it was really fun we're super grateful and i hope people out there are inspired to go and make some on their own thank you so much thank you, Nina. have a great evening everybody thank you so much thank you Bye.